morning, everyone. Thank you for that <clears throat> lovely introduction, Alita. So I'm very happy to be here today to, um, to moderate a distinguished panel. Um, first, we have uh, Assemblyman Gary Scher, Democrat from uh, Bergen, Passaic. Um, as the uh, chairman of the Powerful Budget Committee um, and a member of the leadership team, Mr. Scherer is one of the most influential members of the state legislature, deciding what policies and programs are funded and how, uh, how much they get is a job that he takes very seriously, and we're very happy to have him on, on the panel today. Um, <clears throat> Assemblyman Jay Weber, Republican Morris, Essex Passaic. Uh, Mr. Weber, who has served in the Assembly since 2008, is also a practicing attorney who focuses on business and employment law. He has emerged as one of the legislature's leading critics of policies that will impede our state's economic growth, particularly in the area of employment law. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Jeff Jacobson is an attorney with uh, Kelly Dry and Warren. Um, Jeff has served nearly two decades of experience in private practice, uh, plus uh, two years of recent service at the highest levels of the New Jersey Attorney General's Office. Uh, Jeff helps clients resolve and minimize the uh, reputational damage and the business interruption that can arise from litigation, including costly class actions. He's also considerable experience managing the electronic discovery challenges presented by uh, complex litigation and investigation matters. Uh, so, the first panel today is called, Does Trenton Care What the Legal and Business Communities Think? I think we, I think we know what the answer is there. I think we know what the answer uh, should be. Uh, the question is, um, how does it care? Uh, and, and what does it do? How does the legislature respond? Um, the uh, TCC WNA is on our agenda for later today. And that, that's a statute that raises some uh, particular concerns um, for the business community, and, and other panels will explore that in some depth. Uh, but generally speaking, um, legislation as a whole, um, what, are, what are unintended consequences? And, and how do we deal with those? So we have a relatively uh, small group today. I would encourage all of you to uh, participate in our discussion with, with the panel. Um, I'm sure we'll leave some time for questions, but in the event there's any burning questions, please let us know. I'm sure the panel will be happy to, uh, to deal with those uh, for a spirited discussion. So I'll, I guess I'll first turn to Jay and, and ask Jay to, to start us off with um, dealing with the question of, of unintended consequences. Um, what are those, uh, generally speaking, and, and how does the legislature respond? Is the legislature responsive to what the business community thinks, what, uh, what the public thinks about legislation? How, did, how is that process handled? Well, <coughs> uh, I'm going to object on the grounds it's a compound question. <laughs> <laughs> Noted. Uh, Listen, I guess to address the first topic, the, the unintended consequences topic, th there's a difference between something being unintended and being unforeseen. Um, I find myself in a position often in, in the legislature of um, trying to point out uh, maybe some consequences or anticipated consequences that uh, the sponsors of legislation uh, do not foresee and might not intend, although they might intend them. Um, but uh, let's let's assume that you have legislation that has unintended consequences that you, you didn't foresee. Obviously, if you force, if you saw them in advance uh, coming and you, you didn't intend that that would be the goal of the legislation, but you uh, you went ahead anyway because you had other goals that you did intend, then you knew it was coming. You just didn't intend them. Uh, if you don't see them coming and and you did not uh, then obviously intend them, uh, there you have to go back and fix them. And often uh, the legislature will, but sometimes they won't. Um, they'll just uh, tell you to lump it, 
I'm thinking especially now of uh, uh, an issue that came before us a couple of years ago. And um, it, it was a package of reforms for teen drivers. I don't know if you recall this. Uh, parents with uh, teen drivers might. Uh, all common sense, or mostly common sense reforms that uh, required or restricted teens who were learning to drive and getting permitted uh, to drive um, would restrict them to uh, the number of children in the car that they could uh, have with them while they were being permit, while they had a permit. Uh, the hours that they could drive on the road, uh, backed up by uh, real empirical data that showed us that uh, teens, you know, ju judgment isn't quite as good as adults uh, who got in accidents and uh, driving in the dark, uh, drove too fast, and had uh, more accidents when they had more passengers in the car. The legislation was intended to protect uh, those drivers and the, and the other drivers on the road with them. But part of that legislation was also this requirement that uh, permitted drivers have decals on the car. Do you remember that? Um, sure do. And, uh, and as the legislation was going through, we all looked at the uh, empirically based reforms and restrictions and, the, and, and uh, thought it was a good idea. Uh, they thought the bill made a lot of sense and nine tenths of it did make sense. Nobody said a word about the decal requirement my oldest daughter at the time, I guess, was probably about 11, so I was not quite in that uh, cone of uh, awareness where I'd be thinking about what happens when my daughter's on the road with a decal on her car uh, driving around and somebody would know that, hey, there's a young woman who's no more than 16, 17, and um, you, know, you could perhaps take advantage of that situation. And so the legislation went through and the decal requirements there. Once we passed it, we got a uh, a, an outpouring of protest from, uh, I think, parents who had a very valid concern about that decal requirement. Everything else about the law was fine, but they didn't want their children to have to put decals on their car to signify that they were inexperienced or uh, young uh, and potentially vulnerable. And um, they had very valid concerns. There was legislation to repeal the decal uh, requirement, um, which I sponsored. I thought that was, that was a, a fair point. It hasn't moved anywhere. But I don't know. I, can anybody name the last time they saw one of these decals on a car? Right? So, I mean, if, if you've seen one, take a picture because, and post it on Facebook because I, I, I never see them. I'm, and that's the first story I've ever heard of somebody being uh, ticketed for not having one. Uh, I mean, so there's this law on the books. I don't think anybody respects it and very rarely is it enforced. That was a completely unintended consequence of a bill that otherwise had, again, uh, made a lot of sense. Uh, I hope that we can repeal that requirement. Um, certainly the bill's in the hopper to do that, and uh, that's just a matter of being in the queue for the majority to, to put on the agenda. So I know you're taking copious notes, Assemblyman, and bring that back to your next leadership meeting. We should, we should get rid of that right away bef before he goes to municipal court and defends his, his son's ticket. So Ed, Ed raises a good point, and that is sometimes there's um, there's enforcement of of legislation which seemingly is unfair. Um, other times there is um, ignorance, maybe not ignorance, but rejection of the law. And others, like myself, decided this is not something we can comply with. We're not going. I was not going to put my daughter in the situation of having that target on her car. Um, and so. In the situation you described, there was an outpouring from the community. Um, and uh, other times, there may be an, out, an outcry from um, litigation or from the business community. Um, is, there, is there a methodology for how the legislature can deal with different types of of notices from either the public or from the business community in terms of dealing with legislation once it gets passed. Yeah. Gary, you want to tackle, tackle yeah. that one? Um, just as an introductory remark, I think I must be one of the only or very few members of this group who is not an attorney. Um, so please don't hold that against me. My daughter is an attorney. My brother is an attorney. My brother-in-law is an attorney. But <laughs> So your best friends are in So you got the one person who is not. Um, 
I mean, th this topic is fascinating, and I think it brings up and clarifies perhaps the, the legislative process itself. Um, as many, if not all of you are aware, bills are developed by individual members. That bill then, uh, with the approval of the Speaker or the Senate President, depending upon the House, goes before a committee where it is heard and it is open to the public. The bill then goes to the House itself for a vote. It follows the exact same path in the <coughs> other House, and if the bills are exactly the same, um, it is presented to the governor for his or her approval. So there's a natural vetting process, if you will, that begins, number one, with initiation of a bill, because in 99.9% .9 of the cases, bills are written as a result of something that occurred, a group that requested it, an individual that requested it, uh, a pressing need that is perceived. So there is, if you will, a self-correcting process. There's a, a bill, you'll forgive me, Jay, even more innocuous. Um, the legislature was presented with the bill um, as a result of discussions that were held with Governor Christie and his administration to the Red Tape Commission, which all of you are familiar with, to limit and eliminate unnecessary rules and regulations. There was a bill, and I believe it was during Christie, or perhaps it might have been during Corazon, forgive me, um, but there was a bill which came to us at the recommendation of the School Board Association, and that was to take off the mandatory list of holidays that schools must address. Because there are so many days off, the schools themselves were finding that the teaching calendar was extending further and further into the summer and receiving complaints from any number of parents because it interfered with camp, vacation, whatever it was. Um, the bill sailed through the assembly. Um, there was absolutely no second thought to the bill. After it sailed before the assembly, but before it passed the Senate, there was a hue and cry raised by a number of veterans organizations because amongst those days that were taken off the mandatory list was Veterans Day. Clearly, it escaped everyone. Clearly, people were speechless. And of course, a self-corrective mechanism was immediately applied, providing that Veterans Day would maintain that very, very special status. There's a bill, if you'll forgive me for referencing it, and some of you might know the bill in one form or another, that um, I began working on about eight years ago. It is still in its developing process, and I have no doubt in another 10 years it might be in that still developmental process. <laughs> and the bill is called Out of Network. Um, the reason that I bring up the bill is because there have been probably over 200 to 250 hours of public discussion on the bill. That vetting process should, hopefully, ideally at least, um, eliminate unintended consequences because there are so many different pieces coming to the puzzle. There's an underlying assumption, however, and that is that given a problem with a bill, that the bill sponsor and that the members who will vote for the bill, the members of the majority, whether however that's defined, um, will listen to those concerns. And that is not always the case. There's oft-time belief, frankly, that uh, matters which are undertaken by the legislature can be modified, redirected um, by the executive through regulatory agencies. Um, so there is a perception of a fallback. Um, I will tell you without equivocation that the 40 members of the Senate, the 80 members of the Assembly, which Jay and I have the privilege to serve in, are amongst the most well-intentioned, um, interested, concerned people that you will find in this entire state. I will also tell you that I disagree with a number of them on any number of issues, as I'm sure everyone here would as well especially the Republican. Um, but all kidding aside, these are extraordinarily well-intentioned people giving a tremendous time and effort on their behalf. Um, are mistakes made? The answer is yes. As part of that self-correcting process that we spoke about earlier, uh, 
There's something called a veto that the governor has. There's something called a court system, which can effectively negate the decision by the legislature if, in fact, is necessary. So I think that one needs to recognize that, yes, foolish things are done um, on a consistent basis, but through the system, one hopes to avoid or eliminate many, if not most, of them. <clears throat> and so you've raised a very, um, very important point about uh, the one bill you mentioned, um, the out-of-network bill, where there's many, many hours of of, of public discussion and debate. Uh, does that type of uh, public discussion happen all the time for legislation, or is that sort of out of the ordinary? Oh, in all truthfulness and without equivocation, I would tell you that it is an extraordinary bill, um, both <clears throat> in terms of its reach, its consequence, um, and the amount of time that's been spent on the bill. The bill has gone through many, many iterations. Many of you have been intimate to those iterations. I'd like to tell you that now that the bill is infinitely better than it was when it was first proposed, but I'm not so sure that's the case either. Um, but when one is dealing with matters of such incredible consequence, and I would argue that so much of what we do is of such incredible consequence to someone, perhaps not to all of us, the out-of-network bill is germane to each and every one of us who reside in the state and hopefully are insured in the state. Um, but even the most innocuous bills affect someone. Um, and I think that we need not lose sight of that. But no, I, I would put the out-of-network bill in its own special category uh, for any number of reasons. Uh, if I could uh, bring Jeff into the discussion here. Jeff, as, as the... Uh, Director of Law, um, working through the Attorney General's office, um, did you have the opportunity uh, to um, to notice legislation that was, may have been out of balance uh, during the course of your uh, your tenure there? And, so, and if if so, how did you try to deal with that? So I would say this. I mean, just a little bit of background. The way things work in New Jersey, the Attorney General was appointed by the governor and the division of law in the, in the attorney general's office represents state agencies and departments and employees in all legal matters before the state. There are no lawyers in state government who can practice law civilly except those in the division of law. There's 521 lawyers in the division. And they represent clients. And so I like to think of myself as a, someone who was a political appointee to a non-political job because we represent the treasury he has his perspectives and we carry out his instructions. At the same time though, the Attorney General is the Chief Legal Officer in the state. And for example, the uh, Director of the Division of Consumer Affairs, who makes decisions that are very important to the business community, is an appointee of the Attorney General and by extension the Governor. And he's a client of the Division of Law. So I had, I had the privilege of serving in two jobs. I was Chris Perino's, now the Attorney General Perino's successor as Director of the Division of Law. I subsequently became chief counsel of the attorney general, a um, position I left about six months ago. So I got a chance to see both the service of clients as director of division of law and then the way decisions are made by the chief legal officer as chief counsel. So I thought about, I, I knew this question was coming and I sort of thought about an example I could use. Um, division of law takes legislation as it comes. It's not, it's not really the role certainly of the division of law to have an opinion about the <coughs> wisdom or lack of wisdom about legislation. It's the law and the division of law has served since 1944 governors of both parties and, and legislators, legislatures of both parties and we just carry out the law through the wishes of our clients who are political appointees. But so I think the best example I can cite is about a year ago the legislature, more, uh, more than a year ago, I apologize, about a year and a half ago, the legislature passed a, a, a law called the Pet Protection Act. I may be getting the name a little bit wrong. And what that law provided was that if you're a pet store and you sell dogs or cats, uh, on the cages where you display the animals, you have to include certain information. You've got to include where the dog came from and certain information about its breeding, and then you've got to have certain disclosures about people's rights 
and you've got to put it in, in the fonts of particular sizes, and it's got to, it, you've got to really put these displays on each cage. And the legislature uh, included in this law that you are subject to $500 per violation, which is not $500 per store, that's $500. So if there's five problems with one sign on one cage, and you've got 50 cages, that's 250 violations times $500. And that's the law. And I can understand the motivations of the legislators that passed that law. It's very important both for the protection of the animals and also for the protection of people who are about, about to bring a pet into their homes, that they want to make sure the pet is healthy and came from a responsible source. It's not my role to comment on the on the on either the motivation of the legislators, the legislators who passed this law or the penalties that they decided to provide, but we had to enforce it. So what did the Division of Consumer Affairs do? First they went out with education and they went out to all the pet stores and they said, hey, this law is passed. You've got a, a very limited amount of time to get right with this law and put the notices on the cages. And then they went out with warnings to the same pet stores. Hey, guys, you don't have the right signs on the cages. This is the law. Let's go. And the legislators who were the main sponsors of this law were starting to get impatient with the Division of Consumer Affairs that they had not yet actually fined anybody. And I can understand that motivation. The law was the law. And so we went back out with another round of inspections. And it's all public information. I wouldn't comment otherwise. And we found violations. Now, why in the hell are they violating this? We, we educated them. It's the, they're, they're in the pet business. They should know that this was coming. And it's not that hard to comply with this law requiring signage. But we found, vi you know, it, it, it was, we found major violations. And they were mostly concentrated in the same stores. And if you had a big pet store, which had no excuse for violating this law, but if you had a big pet store and you had 100 cages and you were missing 10, vi you know, that's 1,000 violations times $500. So here's the question. Do you, as the regulator of that business, go into them with fines that can put them out of business. We absolutely had the power under this law to, to assess and enforce fines in the six figures for these pet stores. Some of them might have been able to absorb those fines, others certainly wouldn't. And so the question is, what do you do in that circumstance? Do you start with a massive number and negotiate down? Do you start with a non-massive number and stick to it? What message are you sending to the business community? Are you being faithful to what the legislators had every right to expect? Are you being faithful to the business community in New Jersey that's obviously very important to the economic life flow in New Jersey? So you can see, you can look in the newspapers for what we did. We ended up uh, going out with numbers that were lower than what we could have done. Uh, I subsequently left the AG's office in the, in the after the, not long after those <coughs> initial violation notices were sent out, and so I'm not privy to the back and forth discussions with the businesses after, some of them, but most of them after the, the notices were sent out. But the, the decision about what to do in the initial round of enforcement is obviously a, a very meaningful statement as far as how Trenton feels about the business community because Again, the legislature passed a law and they left it to the executive branch to have a little bit of discretion as to how to enforce it. I'd like to think that we found the right balance where the sponsors of the legislation would think that we did the right thing. I'd also like to think that the business community recognized that we had to enforce the law, that it was not our job in the first instance to put anybody out of business if it was a correctable problem with disclosures. But I, I use that as, a, as an example of a sort of a small thing illustrative of a, a much bigger set of discussions that the Attorney General's office has daily about the way to be faithful to what the legislature wants while also trying to carry out the wishes of our clients who are both the legislature and the executive branch who may be as they are now uh, in control of their department. If I could chime in, um, Please. just maybe supplement this. Jeff makes excellent points. There's an empty seat here. Um, it's like the fifth beetle, the fourth panelist. Um, and and the, the, the person maybe who should have been sitting here was someone from the governor's council's office. Because whereas Jeff has to take the laws as we pass them, as the governor signs them, 
this wonderful thing in the New Jersey State Constitution called the conditional veto. It gives the governor tremendous authority to rewrite the law that comes out of the Assembly and the Senate um, and send it back to us to see if we'd agree is, uh, is I think, a remarkable power. Um, but, but there's a place where unintended consequences and uh, input from uh, knowledgeable individuals, whether it be from the business community, uh, trade associations, uh, knowledgeable citizens, uh, can really make a difference. On a couple of occasions, uh, I've had the opportunity and the satisfaction to work with Governor's Council to correct some flaws in legislation that had made its way through the Assembly and the Senate. Um, the conditional veto, I think, is particularly useful when you have an Assembly and a Senate controlled by one party and the governor of, of another party. Um, here's where uh, the, the Assembly and Senate Democrats might put, put together a package or, a, or an idea, uh, sail through. You might have Republicans in the minority saying, you know, there's, this is fine, but have you considered this angle, this angle, and this angle? And the, uh, if any of you have watched from the gallery in Trenton, anytime time we try to amend a bill, we're very friendly, uh, in a very friendly way, uh, tabled uh, every time, automatically. <laughs> uh, I don't think Predator. But, <laughs> but, but firmly. But firmly tabled um, as, uh, as we try to amend the bill and improve the bill. The advantage I've had for the last six or seven years is having a Republican governor in front office to then run down the hall and say, did, can you believe what they just did? Um, here's five ways you can improve it. And um, on a couple of occasions, the governor's CV has come back and reflected some of the objections that the minority in the legislature has made. And so um, uh, that's, that's one place where before it gets to Jeff and before uh, the executive has to enforce the law, <coughs> some of those unintended consequences can be caught and, uh, and improved upon. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Jay. I <clears throat> just want to get back to, to uh, Jeff's point for a second on, on the enforcement side. Um, what, what you've pointed out, Jay, is um, sort of an interesting process that happens before the law becomes final, and then Jeff is in the situation where he's dealing with enforcing the laws and exercising the appropriate discretion as to <clears throat> how to best manage um, the expectation of the legislator in, in enforcing these laws. So is it, is it practical for, um, for the legislators to simply rely upon uh, the enforcement mechanism uh, for uh, finding out whether or not the legislation is going to work? Or is there some other methodology that the legislature has in, in following up on the laws and finding out whether or not the laws are being followed, whether the laws are being enforced, how they're being applied? In other words, in order to, to determine what the consequences are of the bill. Sort of open that up to. I think that, um, again, this speaks to the process itself, constitutionally as well as practically. Um, one thing that we've not included in our discussions is that when bills are drafted and appear before committee, um, oftentimes the Attorney General's office will come to the bill sponsor uh, and share with them concerns uh, regarding the bill um, in order to give them A, a heads up, and B, more importantly, to ensure that the bill is reflective of law and appropriate. Um, Jay spoke about the ability of the governor to conditionally veto, and I think that's an excellent, uh, excellent point. Um, and I think that we need to be aware that um, since Governor Christie took office a number of years ago, um, never has his CV been overruled. Um, and I think that that speaks to the process as well. Obviously, uh, I voted often to override his CV, and it was never successful. But that speaks to a natural and beneficial friction, if you will, within each house, between the two houses, and between the two houses and the executive itself. Um, there is a natural corrective mechanism um, so that bills will hopefully be appropriate and not be 
And there is a recognition and understanding that the implementation of the bill will not be done on such a level as to effectively put someone out of business, right? I don't think it was anyone's intention, God forbid, to have less pet stores so that people would have less availability to purchase pets and so that small businesses would no longer exist. Could it have happened, I think, becomes the absolute question. And I think that, again, within the self corrective mechanism framework, when we recognize that the governor of this state is, in fact, the most powerful governor in the 50 states, right? um, he is necessarily or she is necessarily left with a large degree of discretion, as should be the case by the implementing authority. Um, it would have been my hope that no one was put out of business. In my hope that uh, words or letters or perhaps the threat of a fine would have corrected the situation. Um, although admittedly we could use a few dollars in the budget, um, that's not obviously the way to achieve that. Right? So again, I would come back to the, to the underlying process itself, um, effectively, hopefully self-correcting to avoid And in terms of the, the process itself, that's really what I'd like to, to get into more specifically. And and I'm going to, I guess, present somewhat of an imperfect analogy. But um, in you know, in times of uh, we're, we're all faced with issues of, of you know, national security now with um, with what's going on in, in our politics and um, understanding that as citizens, we all want our the government to sort of cooperate with each other, right? We want we want the FBI to be able to tell um, the CIA what they know and vice versa, and other um, agencies to share information for the for the benefit of of the government as a whole and benefit of the public. So, is there any type of um, method for um, for the legislature to receive information from? Um, whether it's the Attorney General's office or from the public at large about what effects uh, a piece of legislation is having over the course of maybe it's one year, maybe it's ten years, yeah. uh, and how and how that um, um, possibly could be reevaluated. You know, there's uh, Michael. I, I hear you almost begging for some systematic review of what we've done to see if what we've done made sense and has actually uh, improved the lives of uh, the people in the state. Um, I hate to break it to you. <laughs> uh, there isn't one method, but that's not to say that there aren't avenues and there aren't mechanisms for that. I mean, uh, I think a big mechanism is my email address and the phone number um, to my legislative office. People come in all the time to talk about issues, how they're affecting them, uh, maybe it's a law that we passed or uh, a law that they want to improve things. Uh, so there's direct contact with legislators. Uh, there are committee hearings. Uh, I had the pleasure of serving on the budget committee with Assemblyman Chair for six years or so, and we, we sat through 15, 16 hearings every spring to, to hear from each department on how they were doing, but also um, to hear from the public uh, on matters affecting the budget, which is basically anything they wanted to come in and say. Um, we love preparing for those, by the way. Yes, I'm sure you did. They have binders I like this theory. for the Attorney General. All of the commissioners seem to have a similar feeling towards the budget. I, I, I couldn't, can't understand, imagine why. couldn't understand why. But um, Gary has often expressed this frustration in Trenton, and I don't think he'll shrink from it today. So much of what goes on down there is point to point. Uh, how do we get to uh, the next budget cycle? How do we get through uh, this month? How do we solve this problem, whether it's transportation trust fund, whether it's pensions, uh, whatever it is, um, that I don't think there is a systematic view towards reviewing uh, what we've done to see if it made sense, to see if it is working. There are mechanisms for us to do that. We, 
rely mostly on feedback from the public. As I said, we could ask the Office of Legislative Services to do uh, research and surveys, and they will do that, and they're very competent. It's a nonpartisan research arm of the legislature. But, um, but there is no particular mechanism, and I think you're caught in kind of a natural posture for elected bodies, which is um, not necessarily looking towards the next election, but uh, having to deal with the urgent uh, as opposed to focusing on the important. And uh, it might be a little bit of a frustration to you as, uh, as you're looking to, for some kind of you know, safety net here. Well, in terms of, of how the business community um, voices their concerns, um, We've talked a little bit about um, enforcement and, and certainly not creating legislation that's going to put companies out of business and enforcement from the Attorney General. Um, that's not going to put companies out of business. It's discretionary. But um, is, there, um, is there a way that, that the legislature can respond to the business community when the business community feels it's being targeted uh, in an unfair way by a certain piece of legislation? Being put the out of business. The process itself is, is based upon, as Jay just said, people emailing, people calling, people speaking with legislators. Obviously, when people get together with other people with shared values um, and they present those concerns to legislators, um, everyone applauds the process. Um, many times, those individuals coming together are paid to do such. They become lobbyists, and all of a sudden, um, it's wonderful when a few citizens come together, but often when a few lobbyists come together, there's a certain disconnect, I think, in our democratic system. Legislators are motivated by any number of different things. I will admit to you that those of us who live in urban areas have different goals oftentimes, different priorities oftentimes, than our more suburban or rural colleagues. Everyone here is certainly aware of the uh, constant discussion of northern Jersey versus southern Jersey versus central Jersey. Um, that reflects that as well. For many, many people, the voice of business, whether it be through NJBIA or CIANJ or any number of, of other groups, the pharmaceutical industry, for example, um, depending on the legislature, legislate for many Many of these groups are listened to extraordinarily clearly. For others, they're not listened to at all. Um, I myself, speaking of pharmaceuticals, I happen to be close to the industry, um, and very proudly so, but I don't have any pharmaceutical in my district. Right? Um, and gosh knows how many people who are employed by the industry who live in my district. So that would motivate many, many people in terms of the degree and extent with which they would read those emails that go to Assemblyman Weber's office or the phone calls that come to mind. Um, we just had a recent vote in Trenton on the Transportation Trust Fund. Um, and my chief of staff came to me and said, we've been uh, swamped with phone calls. Um, and I said to him, well, before you tell me what they were about, did you separate the in-district from the out-of-district? Because frankly, the out-of-district is of less consequence to me um, than the in-district, which speaks to a larger issue, perhaps, and that is the whole process itself. Um, and Jay pointed it out expertly. Um, I am motivated by any number of factors, but let me confess to you that the most important thing that I can do during my two-year term in the assembly is get reelected. Right? I'm not paid for vision. I'm not paid to plan something 10, 15, 20 years in advance, which my constituents are going to hate because they cannot see that long term, which perhaps I can. So there's practical realities to the whole process of democracy itself. And I think that we can't lose sight of that as well, right? Um, those people who 
sponsors of the bill in terms of the, uh, the animal rights legislation were motivated, I would suggest, by wonderful intentions, no doubt buttressed by any number of consumer groups and pet advocacy groups. They did it for the right thing, for the right purpose, for the right goal. Um, I don't remember who the bill sponsor was in the assembly. I was, I'm sorry? Okay. Um, and in the Senate, I assume I'd make a leap of faith and suggest it was Ray Lesniak, but that's another story. Um, from such advocacy, possible governors come. We should be respectful of that. Um, again, well intentioned stuff. Um, and, and are we uh, persuaded um, by any number of lobbying groups, by the way, to come back to that issue? I will tell you, I, um, I do this full time. Um, and at that point, in terms of career work, I can afford to. Um, on any given day, I will have anywhere between four to 12 meetings with groups. Uh, when you're budget chair, you have that, that privilege and that obligation. Um, I'm constantly listening to people's concerns. Uh, some of it resonates. Admittedly, some of it does not. Um, but the inherent process, I would argue, is as good as it could be. If I could ask uh, Jeff to uh, maybe tackle this question. Um, oftentimes, the courts get involved in, in reviewing uh, particular statutes, pieces Don't of legislation. <laughs> and, uh, and very often, courts will say, uh, I'm not sure what the legislature intended by this particular statute, but it seems to us that this set of facts fits within the framework of that statute. And we're going to refer to the legislature if they would like to amend it um, or not. And there was a fairly fairly recent case um, involving the, the TCC WNA, um, which involved um, uh, the Shelton versus Restaurant.com case that involved an electronic gift certificate. And you know the court was faced with looking at. Uh, what the definition of property was and was this electronic certificate something that the legislature could have intended was property, um, given that the, the internet um, was not even available in 1980 when, when uh, the act came into being. So um, my, my question really is, given sometimes that courts have commented upon legislation, is there a, a way or a method for the legislature to respond to that, either um, in, in, the, in the Senate or Assembly or in the, by way of the Attorney General's office? Well, look, I think that courts, this is, this is no different in the state system than it is in the federal system when you have the whole process of figuring out should we be applying the words on the page, should we be looking for legislative intent um, I think that we've been well served in New Jersey by judges looking at the words on the page and leaving it to the legislature if they don't like the way a, a particular statute has been interpreted by courts to make that decision as opposed to the judges trying to discern an intention behind the words. Um, I can point to any number of statutes that the legislature in its wisdom and I'm sure intentionally left broad. The public record statutes is a, is a Oprah is, a, is an example of that, where the, the New Jersey uh, in the early 90s went from have being a state with a fairly restrictive public records law to being a state with among the most broad public records laws in the country, if not the broadest. But it's, it's very vague with a lot of exemptions that are up to the imagination of judges as to whether they apply or they don't apply. Judges are wrestling with that and many other statutes every day. And so the, I, 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 from the time that I spent in service, I certainly agree with the introduction and I agree with, with what both of the, the legislators to my right have said, which is that this is an extraordinarily well-intentioned and hard-working group of legislators who I was privileged to have the you know, chance to defend the statutes that they passed. 
sometimes it, it, the courts reacted in a way that I, I thought made sense, and sometimes they, they didn't. Um, another way I might respond to this is, is, you know, we're all familiar with the decision that the Supreme Court made uh, a year or so ago with respect to pensions and whether or not the, the compromise between the governor and the legislature was, was something that yielded a constitutional level obligation to, to pay the pensions. And the argument in that case, and obviously the, our, our client in that situation was the Treasury. The Treasury had an opinion, the governor had an opinion. That case was argued by an assistant attorney general named Jean Riley, who was one of the best lawyers I've ever seen. And she understood this issue at a, at a basic level and was able to make the case to the Supreme Court and I am 100% certain that if a, a lawyer less competent, less brilliant than Gene argues that case, the two justices who dissented, who were the Chief Justice and Justice Alvin, would have been joined by a couple of colleagues, and that case could have gone the other way. Now, I'm not, I, I recognize that there's different opinions of whether the case should have gone the other way, but this was a circumstance where a lawyer really had an impact on that outcome. So that was one where Judges were, were looking at it very conscientiously. There were fierce advocates on both sides. And the, somebody who was, who, who was willing to work for the state and leave a lot of money on the table to do so made a huge difference in the way the judiciary responded to a statute passed by the, by the government, signed by, passed by the legislature and signed by the governor. So I, I, I don't know if that was a complete or even a good answer to your question, but that's, I think, what I can give you. Jay or Gary, do you have any, any comment on that, how, how um, the legislature might respond to what the court's view is on a particular piece of legislation? I mean, I've always, the, the <coughs> doctrine of legislative acquiescence, I think, is, um, is a fair one to employ uh, when a court announces that uh, this is how we're interpreting your law. <laughs> if you want to, if we're wrong, you change it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a, that's a fair statement and a, and a fair approach uh, by the judiciary and it's incumbent upon the legislature then to um, to correct the interpretation or the misinterpretation. Uh, I've done that, scanned appellate division decisions, uh, seen where I thought a statute was misinterpreted and, um, and tr uh, sought clarification uh, by submitting a bill. Now, you know, there's one judge <laughs> with that interpretation or a, p a panel of the appellate division and then you need 41 and 21 and, uh, to get it through the assembly and the Senate and get the governor to sign it. So it takes a lot to overcome that mm -hmm. uh, interpretation, but uh, it seems to me to be a, a, fair, a fair doctrine. And if there's an interpretation and the legislature does nothing about it, then uh, that, that uh, interpretation tends to stand. And by the way, it's worth noting that Tequina, which is what we're going to be talking about later, I mean, we're, we're, there has not been yet the truly bad decision that is a hot torpedo in the water heading for the business community of New Jersey. There are a bunch of subjudice. I mean, there are half a dozen cases that a lot of lawyers in this room are involved in. I'm involved in one that, you know, you could get a decision that suddenly is going to motivate uh, the legislature to take a look at this statute. But I, it's not surprising to me that right now they're waiting to see what the judiciary does. But there are a lot of really good lawyers on both sides of this issue arguing for what that statute means. And if, they, if judges think that it means something other than what the legislature presently thinks it should mean, given the potential impact on the business community in New Jersey, I'd like to think that there will be a reaction by the political branches. There certainly should be. Lita. Actually, I had a question just taking off on what I think all of you were, were discussing r regarding Jeff's example about the um, the pet store and some of them share your, your comment that you know clearly everyone who voted for that just wanted to protect small furry animals and no one was looking to put pet stores out of business and you know I think what one thing that was interesting is the way Jeff was describing how that evolved was he they had the dis discretion and you know the opportunity to be sort of conscientious in the way that that statute was applied to, to those pet stores. I'm not actually familiar with the statute, so I'm, I'm curious whether there was, in addition to that, a sort of um, a 
private right of action in there, and I'm guessing not just because what would the, you know, what would the, the ascertainable loss or, or, you know, whatever to sort of to get you standing be to enforce that, but in a slightly different context, and, you know, Tequina or, or any a number of other largely regulatory um, statutes that rely on something like the Consumer Fraud Act for a private right of action enforcement, I would say I would be concerned that a private attorney bringing an action in a, in a situation like that might be somewhat less conscientious in the way that they, they were concerned about and with the way Jeff was concerned about overwhelming um, penalties for, for a violator. And so what I'm, I guess I'm, what I'm asking is when we're talking about these unintended consequences, how much concern do, do, do you uh, assemblymen have on the enforcement mechanism and sort of walking down that road to, to imagine how that implementation would take place and whether you do run the risk of enforcement being the sort of thing that puts, uh, uh, puts you know, a well-intentioned business out of business and what can we all do to better highlight those sort of risks when you're when you're discussing this legislation? So, admittedly, in the past number of years since Governor Christie took office, there have been a number of concerns raised uh, by members of the majority party, the Democrats, in terms of whether or not the administration was appropriately and adequately responding to legislation there have been any number of examples where the legislature through its individual members have in fact claimed that the executive has not been responsive and has not properly enacted bills. You'll forgive me not wanting to sound like a broken record, but that again speaks to the process itself. And necessarily so. Um, there is a natural friction between the executive and the legislature um, a little bit later today, I understand you're going to be hearing from uh, Ambassador Murphy. Um, for many of us, presumably we look upon him as the next governor of the state. Polls suggest also that both the Assembly and the Senate will be overwhelmingly, if not even more than they stand today, Democratic. So the question that's been raised with me is fundamentally within the necessary balance of power between branches of government, um, and within those branches of government, will the people of New Jersey be served appropriately by having everyone come from one party? Um, and the response, of course, is that the differences within that one party, as within the Republican Party, if I can be so bold, um, and certainly we've learned that even more so in the past few days, um, the tents are very wide in both cases that there is a natural corrective mechanism. I don't know any legislator, again, who would want to put those pistols out of business. Right? Um, are there other availabilities for individuals to challenge, et cetera? The answer is yes. Of course there are, there must be, the legal system. But I think that our form of government, not only in New Jersey, but nationally, depends upon, um, and I hesitate to use the word, but depends upon some moderation, um, some step away from radical action, whether it be left, right, whatever it is. Um, and I think that our system of government, frankly, depends upon that more moderate approach coming out the winner in most, if not all, cases. Well, we've reached the uh, end of our time, so I just wonder if there's any, any questions we have for our distinguished panel. Surely someone must have a question. <laughs> uh, can, 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 I, can I, I just want to propose and maybe start a little bit of discussion. We, we had a situation uh, where the Attorney General commenced an investigation into these third party energy suppliers um, who a couple of winters ago when the weather turned cold and, and there was an, a crisis in the energy markets, these third party providers could not live up to their promises and people were hurt in New Jersey, people who were promised savings, uh, 
without equivocation were not given that savings. And they faced both private class actions and investigations by the Attorney General's office where the goal of our investigations was to get recompense for consumers. So basically we were in tension with the class action bar at that point because we were both trying to get money for the consumers. The only difference was we were not going to have transaction costs associated with what we were doing. And in that circumstance, the settlements that we worked out actually ran over the class actions, and the class actions yielded to us. And, you know, there were private deals made on an individual basis with the class action lawyers. I wasn't privy to those. But the, the main compensation to consumers came by virtue of the AG investigation. And so I'm just wondering, from the perspective of, of two very well, you know, two very smart, very well-intentioned legislators from both parties, how do you see the interplay between a private right of action where the class action bar is, is the main driving force behind trying to get recovery for consumers, but they have a financial motivation to do so, and the attorney general uh, enforcement mechanism, which on the one hand does not have that transaction cost, but on the other hand, is, as Chairman Chair was saying, they may not act with the uh, alacrity that the legislature might have in mind, depending on the partisan divide. Well, uh, cognizant of running up against our, uh, our timeline here, our deadline, I do want to try to allay, uh, well, share in Gary's fear of uh, Democratic control of the legislature and uh, Google me. Again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's a, a horrifying It's uh, going to be thought. a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I also want to lay your concerns because uh, I, I say this in all good humor, uh, you always find a way to mess it up. So <laughs> I have confidence in your ability to, to continue. Um, uh, in terms of the private right of action versus uh, government, I, I'm a lawyer, I'm a litigator. Uh, small shop just down the road. I would benefit tremendously from creating all sorts of private rights of action. Uh, in all likelihood, uh, I tend to vote against them. I, I, don't, I don't think it's a good way to uh, regulate society. Uh, tort law seems to me uh, to uh, be uh, everything that legislature shouldn't be. Uh, retrospective and uh, piecemeal uh, and uh, private uh, profit oriented as opposed to what I think we're paid to do, which is try to be prospective and uh, uh, broadly applicable and uh, without a, a profit incentive. So um, I tend to disfavor the creation of private rights of action or expand them um, where they exist. Um, I, no, I do that knowing that it, it is contrary to my personal interests and, and also with the great comfort that uh, even as I vote no, most of the Democrats vote yes and, and uh, create or try to create new laws uh, to help people sue others uh, anyway. So um, uh, that, that's my perspective. That's kind of my approach. And I do try to tamp down on litigiousness in the state. I think it's, uh, it's an, kind of a hidden tax that uh, people don't realize they're paying, but they do. Uh, and uh, while certainly some uh, cases and, and, and statutes are important and meritorious, else? I would, I would love Assemblyman Chair's perspective on that. I mean, it, it, just in, in case I, I the sort of the real nub of my probably an artfully worded question earlier was you can rely on the discretion of administrative enforcement, especially if, as, as you predict, uh, the, the next administration might have a, a policy angle that, that you find, <clears throat> you know, that you find greater comfort in but there, there is a, a different set of incentives when it comes from administrative enforcement than from the, the sort of privatized attorney general private litigation model for enforcement. And do you, do you have sort of you know, thoughts or concerns on, on that divide? The, the sort of the question that, that Jeff raised. So I think that we're speaking here about governing philosophy and ideology drive us to one camp or another. Um, I think that overall members of my party would concur that class action 
forgive me, unintended consequences that far exceed. Um, listen, I uh, am a sponsor of a bill that would limit Don't ask me how I came up with $50 million, although I can quickly look at Marcus and he can tell me why I came up with $50 million <laughs> before, um, which sounded like a great figure to me, although perhaps $40 million is more appropriate or perhaps $100 million is more appropriate. So the issue becomes the fundamental and then the response in terms of the amount. Um, I'm concerned, perhaps overly concerned, that individuals retain their right actions as necessary. I'm also cognizant that so often individuals don't have the resources to battle against um, large corporations with much deeper pockets. Right? And how does one facilitate um, individuals having that ability? Right? Um, I don't mean to sound foolish here, um, although oftentimes I do, but I believe inherently one needs to look at the availabilities to individuals and to the public to achieve resolution of their grievances. Um, I think the current system that we have overall provides for that despite its imperfections um, in much the same way that the legislative process and the executive process and judicial process prevents usually um, the most egregious being passed. Right? Um, and the good news is, by the way, speaking earlier, when Governor Corzine um, served um, in Trenton, um, there was both an assembly and a Senate which was democratic, and I would suggest that those were amongst the most tumultuous years right, within the whole legislative process. So there's hope that will not be again. <laughs> <laughs> Republicans can't do to the Democrats, the Democrats effectively will do to themselves. <laughs> that's it. To God but that's you. okay, given the, given the possibility of who I can vote for on November the 8th, it's, um, the field has become dramatically limited, at least in terms of Republican legislators and Congress people and Senate. So. Um, it's, it's a difficult system. It's an imperfect system. Um, the question is, how does one achieve goals that one needs to achieve, and I would suggest that one of the largest goals that one needs to achieve um, is the availability of people to seek redress, um, and in the current system, in fact, as imperfect as it is, that redress is available. Well, thank you, and please join me in thanking our panel very much for...